Nick, I appreciate you taking some time to catch us up with all the work you and your team are doing here at Mobile World Congress Los Angeles. But first, I, I'm just kind of curious, given the unique position that Sequans is in as a chip and module maker focused on IoT. So maybe to start, you could just give us a high level overview of your IoT strategy. Sure, uh, so before I, I take you to my strategy, I think the first thing we need to do is define what IoT really means to us. So we have two diverse segments in our business we call broadband IoT and massive IoT. And it kind of deals with the speeds and feeds. The broadband IoT side is more the Cat4, Cat6 type product, which is going into fixed wireless access type applications. And then the massive IoT is all the other stuff that we do in the very low power, low data rate type, uh, type segment, if you will. And we're kind of focused on those two areas. Now, in terms of defining our strategy, I would say for, for IoT, our, our biggest focus is really on, on, on this low power area, if you will. So we define our strategy basically and how we focus on the devices in three, I would say three different uh, segments. Number one, I would say is integration and security. To us, that is the most critical aspect of IoT today. If you look at all the hacks and all the things that are happening out in the, in the various places, uh, we spend a significant amount of time in that, in that area. By controlling our chips and our modules, our hardware, our software, our firmware, everything that goes along with that, uh, we actually have created a system in which uh, our security uh, is, is, is fundamental. It's, it's, it's the one thing that we can say that our system is 100% secure because we control all of it. So that's the first aspect of it. The second aspect of it is the ecosystem. Uh, in this business, uh, it's, it's, it's a very fragmented market, if you will. Uh, when we talk about IoT, we talk about applications like tracking, we talk about applications like metering. In industrial, there are probably a 50 different kinds of applications out there. There is pet tracking, there's asset tracking, there's, and, and the list keeps going on. There's about 20, 30 different players in each one of those segments, if you will. And, and what that ends up doing is, you can't create a solution for every single customer. So. What we decided a long time ago is the way to do that is, is with the ecosystem of partners. So what we've done is we've grown our partnerships with companies like Skyworks, with companies like Renesas. Renesas is building microprocessors, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi. With the recent acquisition of Dialog, they've actually increased that. Uh, with companies uh, like Infineon, who's again acquired an MCU company that has acquired uh, you know, uh, bits and pieces of other companies. We have NXP, we have Microchip. So what we're doing is we're partnering with these people in order to create complete solutions for our customers that can simplify them taking these solutions to market. And then the third part of it is really the customizations. It's not a one shoe fits all approach in IoT. Uh, what it is is Every customer that we've talked to requires something a little bit different. And what we're able to do really well because of our focus and our, and our ownership of our chips and our modules is basically be able to take the unique uh, requirements of these customers and do small little things for them. So those three things is what I think is, is, is fundamental to our chips and modules in terms of our IoT strategy and what defines our IoT strategy. Right, and maybe we could uh, segment our conversation a little bit and start by looking at LTEM and MBIoT. I know you're in the second generation of your Monarch technology. Can you just give us an idea of the market traction you're getting and how the product's being used by your customers? Oh, sure. Um, so indeed, our, our, our Monarch has been a phenomenal success. Uh, the entire Monarch 2 solution that we're selling today uh, is, is adopted by a very large, diverse customer base. So let me talk about some of the successes. So uh, we're seeing success, very strong success in areas of, uh, of medical, in areas of metering and, and, and smart city applications. Uh, and let me explain a little bit more what in those segments is, is really doing well. So when we talk about metering, if you will, the, the market segment of metering is very significant. I mean, there's 
hundreds of millions of meters deployed, and all these are being digitized with cellular today. Um, so we're having success in metering because what we can do is by controlling our chips, our modules, uh, like the Monarch 2, we're actually able to do power consumption, which is on an order of magnitude less than what our competitors can offer in this field. Uh, just to give you an example, one of the companies we're, we're, we're dealing with today in the metering segment was able to take their battery life on the same battery that they're using today. They were doing about 12, 12.5 12 years, and they just switched the module from a competitive solution to a sequence-based one, and were able to get 23 years from the same battery. So that has been very good in terms of us. The metering segment is one of our very strong uh, uh, verticals, if you will. The second one I talked about is the medical segment. So again, some of these medical devices are being driven by insurance. Insurance is paying for this. Post-COVID, what we start to see is many of the, the uh, uh, healthcare is going to go remote. You have telehealth and you have all these things popping up. <laughs> And the insurance companies need to provide this health care to, to, these, to these people. And, and, and the way they're doing that is they're actually putting cellular in some of these devices, like blood pressure monitors, body scales, uh, you know, uh, heart uh, monitoring devices. And, and the reason for cellular in these makes sense, as opposed to Wi-Fi, because most of these are being used at home, is because people don't know how to configure Wi-Fi. It is always connecting, disconnecting. You have issues with Wi-Fi. Uh, my, uh, my father doesn't even know what Wi-Fi is, as an example. So having cellular on there that just comes out of the box and ready to go makes a lot of sense for these insurance companies to be able to track that people are being used and the coverage is being provided to these people. In addition to those two segments, obviously, uh, we have very strong presence in the industrial IoT segment. We have very strong presence that, uh, that continues on our asset tracking business. Uh, we were designed in with a lot of our CAT1 solution, which is before Monarch, we called it the Calliope. And all those customers are now transitioning with us to, to the Monarch 2. So there is a group of, 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 of applications in the past which continue to move with us as we transition from the old CAT technologies to the newer CAT M1 Monarch 2 based solutions. I also wanted to get some perspective and insight from you around private LTE networks. Uh, it's been coming up in panel sessions and in meetings that I've been having during the show. Obviously, a lot of opportunity there if we get it right. But I I'm curious from your perspective, what do you think the market opportunity is at a high level for telecoms sector and then specifically to Sequans? What are you all doing to uh, carve out your own niche there? Yeah, so that's a very good question. I mean, for, for Sequence, uh, private LTE is a very important segment for us, and I'll, I'll, I'll kind of elaborate a little bit more. To, to me, I see two different areas of private LTE for us. Uh, number one is when a customer comes to us and says, I'm building something very unique, I want to have my own network, and I want you to do something customized for me. Again, coming back to the original thing where we started, where we own our chips, our devices, our modules, our firmware, our software, uh, we can do all kinds of things for customers. So we have a group of customers that have actually asked us to add Doppler features because they're communicating over satellites. Uh, that's a private LTE network that they have. So we continue to invest in that and we continue to monetize that business uh, with these very large companies that want to do something very unique which is very, completely different. The second aspect of private LTE that we see is the up and coming CBRS uh, network and, and we've had a lot of excitement and enthusiasm from people here in the show uh, asking us about our CBRS. Now going back, Sequence started as a WiMAX company back in the early 2000s. And WiMAX, if you know, is really three and a half, two and a half and three and a half gigahertz. And as we transitioned into LTE, we kept that frequency with us. So CBRS has been ingrained in the company from day one. We're, we decided about a year and a half, two years ago, that we would take whatever that was and build our own CBRS only, private LTE only chipset. So this, 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 sorry, module. And this module today only has CBRS. So it doesn't work with, uh, 
with the uh, operator's uh, networks, it only works on CBRS and aims specifically at private LTE. If you look at what has been um, happening in the market, you look at some of these school districts. Again, post-COVID, what we see is remote learning has become important. And some of these school districts are actually don't have the funding to continue to pay the MNO type fees. And what they've started doing is they've actually gone and bought spectrum of CBRS and they're deploying it in their, uh, in their school districts here in the United States of America. And what they're providing kids is small little dongles and small little CPEs that can be used and can be transported from school to home and be able to deploy the networks, uh, be able to have them connect to the networks. And, and similarly, companies like massive logistics companies that have big warehouses and things are starting to connect on CBRS, buying these frequencies, and we see a large uptake on the CBRS side. For our side, we've actually delivered the CBRS module. We're starting to see a very large uptake um, in, in terms of the design interest, and, and, and we hope and hope expect to see next year this to be one of our largest growth markets, if you will. And then, you know, it wouldn't be a proper telecommunications discussion if we didn't talk a little bit about 5G. So, you know, for years, 5G has been billed as the, uh, the thing that's finally going to enable massive IoT. So, I, I mean, first part of the question would be, when is that inflection point going to occur? And the second part of the question would be, what does that imply for the long-term evolution and use of MBIoT and LTEM? Okay. Um, again, so first I gotta step back and I gotta say LTM and NB-IoT are 5G technologies. And, and the reason I say that is from the very start of LTM and definition of LTM and NB-IoT, 3GPP made it very clear that these technologies would last for a very, very long period of time. So when you talk about inflection points, I think the inflection point is when LTM and NB-IoT are going to ramp. Now in terms of 5G and, and, and things and evolutions that we will see happening in this, in this LTM and NB-IoT game is, is on a software perspective, our LTM chip and our NB-IoT chip already supports releases that go out into the future. Release 15, release 16, release 17, we've done all the work, we've designed and, and, and built the chip such that we can incorporate all these things the good things coming out of 5G, as people call it, which is really the new radio part of things, is there's going to be some better coverage, there's going to be some better latencies, and there's going to be dynamic spectrum sharing. So with those things, we definitely see benefits coming to the IoT domain in terms of massive machine type communications, if you will, but our chips are already capable to do that from a software perspective. The one thing that we will need to work on, and, and, and again, because we own our own stack and our firmware, is the incorporation of this into the new 5G core. So it's software work, it's stuff that needs to happen, but again, we're, we're confident that the way we've dimensioned the chip, we can do that. In terms of hardware, I don't think, at least based on what I know, which is release 18, which is in scoping at this point in time, not even in definition, there is no nothing in release 18 that comes close to LTM and NB-IoT in terms of the power, in terms of the speed. There is a definition of a product called a red cap, which is reduced capacity. It'll start getting down to about the 100 megabit type range, maybe the 50, maybe the 40 megabit type range, maybe start competing with CAT1 type technologies, but it's never going to drop down to the LTM and NB-IoT side of things. Now, over time, I would expect that the uh, 3GPP is going to look at ways to, to have LTM slash NB-IoT type hardware for new radio or for release 19, 20, 21, whatever that may be. But I think we're a long ways away from that. In summary, for me, the most important thing is, in terms of 5G, LTM and NB-IoT today should be considered as 5G enabled, 5G ready, and we're ready for it today. Well, Nick, I really appreciate you taking the time to speak with me and uh, share the work that you and your colleagues at Sequans are doing. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much.